of seven thriller writers whose backgrounds range from intelligence officer to journalism, to psychotherapist, to White House strategists. To let you know how this is gonna go, for you participants in the Zoom room, you will be in the gallery during the reading. We encourage you to introduce yourself by typing your name in the chat bar and, and with any questions as well. For those of you joining us on Facebook Live, please comment if you have anything you'd like to tell the authors and especially if you have a question you'd like to ask. The authors will be reading only briefly, so we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. All of the books discussed here tonight should be available through your local bookstore. Let's all use the hashtags Rogue Reads and Rogue Women Writers as we post about our experiences with these authors and their works. As I said, my name is Lisa Black, and I'm the author of 15 novels featuring forensic specialists, which also happens to be my day job. I am based here in Florida working my, with my local police department, and I am thrilled to be emceeing this event. Now, in no, more, no particular order, we're going to introduce our five authors and then come back to each for their reading and discussion of their latest book. At the end, we'll do some round robin questions. If you have any questions, please post them at any time. Comments and questions will be monitored and relayed to the authors in real time. Just so you're aware, uh, Hank has to blip out at, <laughs> at about 40 past the hour because she has another event. So, so you're aware of that. So we're gonna start with Hank. Hank Flippy Ryan is a force of nature. She's interviewed presidents and Prince Charles, reported on hurricanes and political corruption, worn a wire undercover, founded a theater program for underprivileged children, and taught us all that when you're a TV reporter reporting on a blizzard, wear waterproof mascara. <laughs> She's won numerous awards and distinctions in the writing world and in her new book, her Perfect Life, the character sounds almost autobiographical, an incredibly successful beloved TV reporter. Lily Atwood has fame, fortune, a beloved daughter. All she has to do is keep one secret. And Lily's favorite snack is cheese sticks and Cabernet. So we're gonna hear from Her Perfect Life in a little bit, but first I have a question. When you were a child in Zionsville, Indiana, and you rode your pony to town, <laughs> what did you do with the pony when you like went to the library or into someone's house? Did you actually have hitching posts or things like that? Yes. Uh, first of all, Lisa, thank you. And I'm laughing and laughing over the over the mascara in the blizzard. <laughs> did I tell you ever about that? I was covering a blizzard and I thought I was doing such a good job. And I was thinking, <laughs> Wow, Hank, you know, you're meant to be a reporter. This is just your destiny. I was thinking about how good I was. And when I wrapped up my, my live broadcast in my ear, the producer <laughs> said to me, um, Hank, you might want to just look in the mirror because your mascara is a little off. And I looked like Kiss. I looked like somebody <laughs> Kiss. It was hideous. It was absolutely crazy so yeah that was one of that's one of those moments where you say uh, well, i might be frozen that's one of those moments where you say um glad it's live tv and glad it's over and i'm hoping that nobody taped it and also don't <laughs> pat yourself on the back too quickly because you're doomed you know the universe <laughs> but quickly in answer to your question yeah in zionsville indiana back back in the day when i was a little kid um which is the early 60s there were hitching posts in front of the library in Zionsville. Wow. My pony was named Cadet, and I would hitch Cadet up to the hitching post and get my books and fill up the saddlebag with books and go back and read in the hayloft of the barn behind our house. Red Sherlock Holmes <laughs> and Agatha Christie and Niall Marsh and Josephine Tay, all those wonderful authors, and fell in love with storytelling. <laughs> okay, the child me is like insanely jealous that you had a pony. But <laughs> okay. We're going to be back to you in a minute, and we're going to go on to Margaret so I can introduce her. Margaret Mizuma grew up on cattle ranches in Texas and Colorado, married a veterinarian, raised two daughters, and a host of various animals. But in high school, she began to work in speech pathology and eventually opened her own office for speech therapy and rehabilitation. After selling that, she finally got some free time to create the canine cop and veterinarian partners that drive the seven Timber Creek canine mysteries. She got the idea after learning that her husband's new patient was a canine dog purchased to find drugs in their small town. Her deputy, Maddie Cobb, powers through her investigation with energy bars 
and black coffee. But in between cases, she likes green chili with pork and you can find the recipe on our website. So you live with four dogs now. Do any of them have amazing bloodhound qualities? Oh, unfortunately we live with three dogs now. I'm so sorry to report that our yellow oh. lab passed. Um, it, it, was, it was very hard, but we still have two uh, German short hair pointers and one border collie. And mm -hmm. the German short hair pointers have great noses. They can <laughs> find birds, they can spot anything that you ask them to out in the fields. Um, they often spot things on their walks that we don't want them to spot. <laughs> <laughs> The border collie, on the other hand, doesn't use her nose so much as she uses her eyes. She's very drawn to anything that moves. And um, she has that typical border collie stare where she gets down in a down position and can just <laughs> stare at cattle or little kids or anything that's moving. <laughs> very interesting. That They must be a handful. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay, so we're going to hear from your latest in another minute. Now I want to introduce Alan Eskins, holds degrees in both journalism and law and practiced criminal law for over 25 years. He and his wife live in Minnesota. His books are not a series, but revolve around a small town where different characters are different character arcs have them appearing in some books, but not all. In his most recent The Stolen Hours, New prosecutor Lila has to battle her own bad memories while working the case of a woman who was brutally attacked and nearly drowned. Finding a prime suspect is the easy part, but that suspect comes very, very well prepared. Lila's favorite drink is a virgin pina colada because she's in recovery and paired with crab meat sticks. So I really liked, Alan, what you said in an old interview about how your teachers used to complain that you daydreamed too much. <laughs> but those are really stories you were writing in your head because, of course, all writers do that. One of my best books revolved around a little like fan fiction daydream of mine. So have any of your books sprung from a particular daydream? Uh, well, my sixth book, uh, Nothing More Dangerous, um, I started writing it back in 1992. I'd just gotten out of law school and its first iteration, it was a short story about a 15 year old boy in school having a particular daydream. And it was a daydream that I had when I was in school. And so um, I, I wrote that story down and then I wanted to make it better because I'd never taken a creative writing class. So I started studying writing technique just for my own interest to make this story better. And that turned into a manuscript um, and it became my sixth published novel. Very interesting, very interesting. Okay, we're gonna hear from your latest, The Stolen Hours, in another minute. Now we're going to go on to Dr. Vera Kurian. Her debut novel, Never Saw Me Coming, I love that title by the way, almost instantly found a publisher with foreign and film rights snapped up as well. Vera is a Washington DC psychologist who studies social relations. She loves horror movies, existentialism, and puppies. In Never Saw Me Coming, a group of college students who happen to be psychopaths agree to let doctors study them in exchange for free tuition. But Chloe and two other students have more than research in mind. Chloe's favorite snack is frozen Snickers bars with cheap vodka shots. Cheap vodka is pretty much all I drink, followed by an apple teeny. Now, reading your, your blog, I found we have a lot of stuff in common. And I wish we lived closer so we could talk about movies, oh. movies and TV, but especially a love for horror movies. Do you have a favorite horror book? Oh, um, I mean, yeah, I'd have to say Stephen King's It, which I used to read every single summer in uh, <laughs> high school. Uh, it's just, it's a very long book, maybe a little too long, but um, I don't know if there's any book that's scarier or has higher stakes than that book. And it definitely gets weird and into some bizarre stuff, but um, it's just, for some reason, it always stuck with me. 
like. Huh. Very interesting. Okay, now we're going to hear from Never Saw Me Coming in another minute. Going to move on to Karen Cleveland. Our last author of the evening is a Harvard educated former CIA counterterrorism expert whose first book was an international bestseller. Unfortunately, she can't tell us a lot more than that because it was the CIA. <laughs> but in her current book, You Can Run, CIA analyst Jill Bailey is forced to compromise her work to ransom her son, then teams up with a journalist to ferret out those responsible. Like me, Jill Bailey has a sweet tooth and her drink of choice is a Frappuccino paired with a chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> so, by the way, I have to tell you, you are not the only person here who advised U.S. presidents. Our own rogue Karna Bodman was the highest ranking woman in Reagan's White House, and rogue Gail Linz worked as an intelligence analyst. What I want to ask, though, is about film. Um, what is the status of the film version of your book, Need to Know? And is Charlize Theron still attached? Because I was, I've been a fan of hers since like nobody knew who she was. I'm a big fan of hers too. Um, so that was, you know, it was super exciting. Universal Pictures bought the rights to Need to Know with Charlene, um, uh, Charlize attached to Produce and Star and it's still moving forward. So um, I think it's in sort of the, uh, you know, the screenplay is being written, kind of uh, finalized and ironed out. And um, I'm keeping my fingers crossed because that would be super exciting. I think she's, she's such an amazing um, actress and it'd be really awesome to see what she does with the role. It will. That will be super cool. Okay, now we get to actually hear from all these books, just like the best part. So we're going to go back to Hank and hopefully she can tell us about her perfect life and read part of the story to us. You're on mute. Okay. Hank, you're on mute. You're still on mute. Okay. I'm clicking, I'm okay. clicking. <laughs> okay. Like unmute, like, okay, fine, fine. Um, it's yelling at me to unmute myself, but I'm saying yes. Um, you know, her perfect life in five words is sisters, betrayal, fame, guilt, and revenge. So, bottom line, it's two strong women facing off in a high stakes psychological cat and mouse game to prove their truth about a devastating childhood betrayal. And the main character is Lily Atwood. She has fame, she has fortune, she has Emmys. She also has a deep, dark secret. But how can you keep a secret when you're always in the spotlight? So she begins to learn that the spotlight is the most dangerous place of all. So should, shall I read a little bit of- mm -hmm. Please do. So this is the cover of Her Perfect Life, which is also casually displayed behind me, as you see. <laughs> um, it's gorgeous and it's enigmatic and it's uh, sophisticated and very, very shiny. And I love it. <laughs> and I wanted that sort of mysterious look of who is Lily Atwood. She's so perfect that her fans have hashtagged her Perfect Lily. How does Perfect Lily keep a secret? And this is the very, very beginning of the book. They say you can't choose your family, but if you could, I still would have chosen Cassie. She was my big sister and everything she did was perfect. Her perfect dark hair, which curled or didn't depending on what Cassie wanted. She had perfect friends and perfect dates and whispered phone calls and boys came to pick her up in their cars. She got to wear lipstick. Once when I sneaked hers and tried it, she caught me. She didn't even laugh or yell or tell on me. But when Cassie went away to college that year, something changed. She came home for winter break, but she stayed in her room. My mother and I couldn't figure out what she was doing. Cassie would come out only to make cups of coffee, then stare out the window at our snow dappled backyard, at the pond where she'd tried to teach me to ice skate, and at the big sycamore tree where we'd once found a huge hornet's nest that fell in a summer wind. I'd picked it up and wanted to save it for show and tell, but Cassie screamed and told me it was full of bugs. She grabbed it from me and one stung her. She didn't even cry. 
We had a dog too, a deer and dopey rescue named Pooch. Cassie never liked the name, but our dad did. And then dad died and Cassie never wanted to change Pooch's name again. When she left for college, Mama kept her room just the way it was with all her stuffed animals and souvenirs and photographs and didn't let me move out of my little bedroom into her bigger one. Cassie was always the favorite and I thought of it as her right. That first college winter vacation, my mother found a notebook, one of those black ones with white dots on the cover. She opened it to the first page. I saw her face change. Without a word, Mama turned the notebook to show me. Cassie had drawn a calendar with carefully ruled pencil lines spaced equally apart. November, then December. She'd crossed off the days, each one with an X in black marker. Poor Cassie, Mama said to me. I remember how soft her voice was carrying an undercurrent of worry or sorrow. I wonder what day she's waiting for. This is not the work of a happy person. I know, I'd agreed, nodding sagely, though at age seven, I didn't really know. It was as almost as if Mama wasn't talking to me, but to herself. I do remember how I felt then, even remember my eyes widening in fear of things, dark things or scary things, under the bed or in the closet, things that kids' imaginations, if they're lucky, conjure as murky, vanishing, faraway nothings, things that come in the night, visitors. Mama, what do you think is wrong with Cassie? And then Cassie was gone. Police said they looked and looked for her, even said they tried to make sense of the calendar she'd left behind. My mother got sicker and sicker waiting for her. Years later, I went off to college myself. By then, Pooch had died. Mama eventually died too, never knowing. And then there was only me. What happened to Cassie? I imagined her dead, of course. I'd imagined her kidnapped, imprisoned, hidden, brainwashed, indentured, enslaved, made into a princess, transported by aliens to their faraway planet. I saw her in grocery stores, on book covers, in the backgrounds of movies, a lifted shoulder or sunlight on a cheekbone, that little dance she did when she was happy. Once I saw her, the back of her head three rows in front of me on a plane from Boston to New Orleans and leaped out of my seat with the seatbelt sign still on. But it wasn't her dark hair and not her thin shoulders, not her quizzical smile after my lame, oh, I thought I knew you, excuse. Would I even recognize my big sister after all this time? I was seven when she vanished and Cassie was 18, so maybe, maybe not. Or maybe she'll recognize me. Maybe she'll find me. And that's the beginning of her perfect life. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so nice of you. That is a killer beginning. It sounds very, very interesting. Yay. But you have covered everything from cat shows to the Boston Marathon bombing. So what thing about television reporting do you most enjoy revealing to your readers? I mean, unexpected technical issues or ethical dilemmas, changes in history? The thing, that's a really great question. And I think the thing I can reveal as a reporter writing fiction is the stress and the pressure and the vulnerability. Every one of those Emmys that you talked about that I've won. <laughs> represent something good that's happened a changed i've changed laws and changed lives and gotten millions of dollars in refunds and restitution and you know um, gotten people's homes out of foreclosure but every single one of those emmys also means that i made somebody angry that i revealed a secret that they didn't want me to tell and that means i made an enemy and lily has made enemies too so for all the good that reporters do i can tell you in in this book that there's also the dark side of the spotlight, the vulnerability. Lily chose the spotlight. Lily chose to be in the spotlight and to be public and to have people follow her at the grocery store. But her daughter didn't choose that. Her daughter didn't choose the spotlight. And that's what her perfect life is all about. Is that what's different about this book compared to your other books? Why, why you decided to tell this particular character's story? You know, my other books have revealed the search for truth and the search for justice. What does truth mean? Is it what we hope it means? Is it what somebody tells us over and over? Is it what a court decides? What is justice? Is that is there legal justice? There is, and there's karmic justice, and there's revenge justice, that personal kind of vigilante 
justice. I've, I've explored trust and truth and justice. And I think this book was a little bit of an exploration of fame and celebrity and why um, sometimes people want someone famous to fail, why that fall is so fascinating to us, the, the joy that some people feel when they think, ha ha, she thought she was so great and now look what happened to her. Why, why do we feel that way? And why don't we recognize the vulnerability of the spotlight and the impossibility of having a private life when you're always in the spotlight. So, you know, my books are page turning thrillers, you know, they're psychological <laughs> thrillers. You know, they're not graphic, there's no graphic sex, there's no graphic violence, there's not even inappropriate language, but there's gaslighting and mind games and <laughs> And that's what my books are about. And that's what we all do. That's what we all do to each other. So the Hank DNA is a cat and mouse thriller, but you don't know who's the cat and you don't know who's the mouse. <laughs> okay, well, let's finish up. Tell us your wildest story about working at Rolling Stone. <laughs> oh my God. Um, oh, my wildest story working at Rolling Stone. One yeah. of them was um, I worked with Hunter S. Thompson and we went on tour together across mm -hmm. the country. And we went really? to Florida <laughs> during the time that Jimmy Carter was running for president. And Jimmy Carter's press secretary at the time, no, one of his advisors at the time, we were all in a hotel room in Florida and Hunter decided, Hunter Thompson decided that he was going to teach us all how to breathe fire by <laughs> sucking in lighter fluid and then blowing it out and lighting it on fire. Do <laughs> not try this. Do not try. <laughs> Do not like, try that sounds like a terrible idea. <laughs> You know what, you, Lisa, that is, that is 100% correct. It is a terrible <laughs> idea. That's, I did not do it. I have to tell you, I did not try it. But the others did, and it kind of worked. But don't, don't tell anyone. You ask for the wackiest story. That, that, may, be, <laughs> that may be one of them. That's pretty wacky. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It was wonderful hearing and, from and you. And on that note, right? <laughs> <laughs> on that note, we will move on to Margaret and hear more about the canine mysteries with nice safe dogs who don't like suck in lighter fluid. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about your latest book and, and can you read some of it to us? Yes, I'd be happy to. Yes, you know, uh, dogs that are trained for canine and patrol, narcotics detection, explosives detection, those that are trained to attack only attack when they're told to, or if they are protecting someone and especially their handler. So mm -hmm. yeah, a little safer than what was going on in that hotel room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is Striking Range, and it's the seventh book in the Timber Creek Canine Mysteries. The cover's rather dark because it takes place primarily at night. Um, lots of tracking going on with Robo, the canine partner right here, who is a German shepherd. And then this is Deputy Maddie Cobb. And as you can see, it's set in October and they also have a lot of weather to contend with in this book. So the climate and the weather also becomes a character to challenge Maddie and Robo as they search for humans and evidence. Um, the, the story opens with Maddie, Deputy Maddie Cobb from Timber Creek County arriving at a Colorado State Prison to meet with a cold case detective from California and the two of them believe that the man that they are there to interrogate probably was a witness or killed Maddie's father 30 years prior. The same man tried to kill Maddie in book four, which was six months prior. Book four is called Burning Ridge. And so he's been in prison for that crime, as well as killing some other people in that book. Um, unfortunately, when they get into the prison, the, the, the whole place goes on lockdown. And the reason is because 
the man they're there to interrogate has been found dead in his cell. A, cl a clue leads uh, Maddie and the detective uh, back to Timber Creek and up into the, the mountains outside of Timber Creek, exactly to the area where this man had abducted Maddie and taken her to kill her. Now, this is the first time since Maddie has been back to that area. And so the whole process conjures some pretty strong memories. Mm -hmm. And so I'll start with that. Okay. She told Robo to heal and led him toward the mouth of the cave, hearing the men's footsteps crunch the gravel on the rocky path behind her. Sounds identical to the ones John Cobb had made as he came into that, that cave that night with the intent to torture her. The noise raised an alarm within her solar plexus that was purely driven from cell memory, a phenomenon she discussed with her trauma counselor. Triggers from past trauma could activate, activate the flight or fight response in survivors at the most unexpected times. Well, today she'd expected to be triggered, but that didn't help her control the surge of adrenaline that hit her system right now. Robo brushed against her leg, prancing on his front feet as he gazed up into her eyes, probably trying to figure out her problem. Her emotions always traveled down the leash to him. She stopped before entering the cave and bent to stroke the velvety black fur between his ears, taking a moment to center herself. That night, she'd lain on the floor of the cave, listening for Cobb's footsteps. Her bola tucked beneath her, the rope wrapped over her hands as if they were still tied. The cave spun in cogwheel-like freeze frames, and she had feared that vertigo would overcome her and she wouldn't be able to fight. But the alternative had been certain death. The adrenaline that hit her system that night gave her the ability to fight off her captor and escape. Today, she needed to disperse the energy another way. Deep, steadying breaths. Stroking Robo's ears settled her somewhat and she led him the rest of the way into the cave an alcove shallow, shallow enough for natural light to reveal the interior. She did a visual sweep of the rocky walls and the floor, which were littered with shale and stones. The dank odor of animal scat and de decayed remains wafted from its 40 foot depth, creating another feeling of deja vu from that night. Her experience as a law enforcement officer and a canine handler drove back her fears. She told herself this was just a cave, a rock room 20 feet wide, 40 feet deep, and 10 feet high, nothing more. She eyed the cave's floor and decided it made sense to do a grid search. She clipped a short leash to Robo's collar and leaned over him to thump his sides and deliver the chatter he loved so well. The words that, pray, that raised his prey drive and turned him into a sniffing machine. When he began to dance with anticipation, she straightened and spoke the command they used for an evidence search. Seek. <laughs> that sounds really fascinating. There's there's so much going on in this book that I don't know where to begin. You got the death of the, the prisoner that she needed answers from. You got a forest fire, a dead young woman, a missing baby, freezing winter, and then Cole goes missing under worrisome circumstances. Did you ever look at it as you were writing this and think, how am I going to put all these puzzle pieces back together again? I think I think that every time I write a book, <laughs> I, I, we all? <laughs> in my books, I need to have something that Robo can do, some kind of evidence mm -hmm. he needs to be able to be shown working. I mm -hmm. need to have something that Cole Walker, my other protagonist, and Maddie's love interest needs to be able to do. So there's a subplot there 
that involves coal. And then of course, I have Maddie as the canine handler, the primary protagonist. And then there's the whole cast of supporters from her rural um, sheriff's office. Uh, and uh, Stella, the detective, Brody, the other day, deputy who is fit enough to keep up with Maddie, um, something that's really hard because she also is a machine and um, she, can, she can outrun anybody across country. So um, yeah, I have to have all of that in the books. Plus there's Cole's family, his kids. He, he's <laughs> taking care of, of his kids because his wife has abandoned him and, and his kids and he's newly divorced and he's learning how to take, how to raise daughters while he's working his busy practice. And so mm -hmm. there's that, that little subplot too that's going on. <laughs> Quite a bit. <laughs> Is there, a, is there a real Timber Creek? Well, you know, I grew up in a small town in Colorado that was very rural. And um, I, I take elements from that town to um, build Timber Creek. However, that town was surrounded by agriculture. And I needed a setting that had the wilderness area just right yeah. at their boundaries so that they could go up there. And so I could also, I wanted it fictional, quite frankly, so I could play fast and loose with the setting <laughs> <laughs> and have it be as challenging as I possibly could for Maddie and also to reflect Maddie's very strong character in that setting and as she moved through the setting. So um, no, there isn't a real um, Timber <laughs> Creek, but there are some elements from my hometown. Cool. Yeah. So do you ever use the, the speech pathology background in your stories? Oh, yes. So yes, I was a speech pathologist for 25 years. Um, tracking game has a character who survived a stroke and has a condition called aphasia, which mm -hmm. many of our listeners will know what that, what that is. And um, so that really was the only book where I have really brought some of my speech therapy background. But we who work in that type of business are observers. And we observe people in crisis and we observe people who are in recovery and we observe people mm -hmm. who as they're moving to independence and working through their rehab programs. And um, so I think that, yes, I use that background every time I write a book because my characters are typically in crisis. They're, they're um, right. dealing with very hard situations. Oh, yeah, I can see that give you a lot, lot to work with right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, thank you. That's very interesting. Oh, thank you. Those are good <laughs> questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're going to move on to Alan and hear more about the Stolen Hours. Hi. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Lisa, for doing this and uh, to, for inviting, inviting me on. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with these wonderful writers. Uh, so, when you talked about my uh, being a daydreamer, that really does influence a lot of how my books are written. In 2014, I wrote my, I published my debut novel, The Life We Bury. Uh, the mm -hmm. protagonist in that novel was a college student named Joe Talbert. Um, and when I finished that novel, I had created some secondary characters that I really liked. And the more I lived with this world, this community, the more I wanted to tell their stories. So th there was Joe Tauber, the protagonist. There was Max Rupert, who was a homicide detective. There was Bodie Sandin, a lawyer, and Joe's girlfriend, Lila Nash. And so my second novel was Max Rupert, it, the detective. I told the story about him. Um, the third novel was a case where Max was on one side of the case and Bodie Sandin was on the other. Uh, my fourth novel, uh, I went back to Joe Talbert and Joe and Lila are still together. She's in law school now. Um, just She's just getting ready to take the bar exam. And as my novels progress, my characters grow up and they, you know, they change so that in my own daydreaming, in my own head, 
I have a community of people that they keep existing, keep living. <laughs> and I just tell their stories whenever one of them comes to me and says, it's time to tell my story. So I created this character of Lila Nash, Joe's girlfriend in the life we bury. And I gave her a very tragic backstory. And as I'm writing my other novels, I always wanted to go back and have her story told uh, in terms of how she addresses that. And so my seventh novel, The Stolen Hours, is my opportunity to do that. Uh, Lila is now, she's graduated law school. She's passed the bar. That's not a, a spoiler, but um, she passed the bar. <laughs> she's gotten a job at the Hennepin County Attorney's Office in Minneapolis, and it's her dream job. She wants to be a prosecutor. And something happens, uh, a case comes across her desk that opens this door to her own past uh, and, and that tragic event. Now, throughout these novels, um, people who have read my novels probably see Lila as a very strong person, but in The Stolen Hours, I get to get inside her head and show her vulner vulnerabilities. So um, that was a really fun thing and scary thing, quite frankly, for a male author to do. I, I spent a lot of time reading female writers, writing female protagonists to try and just immerse myself in that uh, kind of writing, uh, including writers here on the, on the dais with me, um, to try and make sure that I, I understood how to, to write a female protagonist. And I think the reviews coming in, I, I'm very, very pleased with how they are saying I've done. So I'm, I'm happy with how it's, how it's working out. So I will now read from the first chapter of uh, The Shadows We Hide. And I will point out that when I was in first grade, I was the second worst reader in my class. So this is a <laughs> touch of PTSD for me to do this. <laughs> well, we appreciate it. <laughs> um, Lila Nash counted her steps as she walked from the kitchen to the bathroom of her apartment. 10, 9, 8. The numbers falling silently in her head, a remnant from those days when she paced the corridors of the hospital. Seven, six, five, turn into the bathroom. Four, three, close the door. Two, turn and face the mirror. One. Her last step had been little more than a shuffle, but it allowed her to stop on one, which somehow eased the clockwork that ticked inside of her chest. Lila never told Joe about the counting. She saw no reason to. It wasn't a secret so much as a private comfort, a blanket she had learned to wrap around herself all those years ago when a head full of silence had the power to coax demons out of the shadows. Now, it had become more of a habit, an echo that refused to die away. Dr. Roberts had once assured her that the counting was a good thing, a coping mechanism to distract her from harmful thoughts. She used a cotton round on her eyes, wiping away what little makeup she used, mascara, eyeliner, and just a touch of shadow. A once over with soap and water and she was ready for bed, almost. She locked the bathroom door, the tiny click far too anemic to reach the bedroom where Joe lay reading. In a cupboard beneath the sink, in a makeup bag, where she stored a collection of old compacts and lipsticks, Lila fished out a small tube of cream, another little secret she kept from Joe. Lifting the sleeve of her t-shirt to expose the top of her left arm, she moved her fingers across her scars, seven thin lines that ran parallel to one another, the braille that told the story of that summer when she was 18, the summer of her attack. Each scar was straight as a toothpick, except for the one in the middle, the first one. She had been crying when she made that cut, her hand trembling enough to give it a slight dip. When she confessed to Dr. Roberts that the flaw upset her more than the cut itself, he seemed to understand. Lila pressed a smidgen of star scar reduction cream onto her finger and began rubbing it into her arm, counting down the strokes. 10, 9, 8. The advertisement promised dramatic results, but after a week, Lila had seen very little change. And again, her scars had had, had, had years to dig in, so she saw no reason to expect them to disappear overnight. Lila wanted to believe that she'd come a long way since in the eight years since she stopped seeing Dr. Roberts but she worried that it had been more of a matter of time and distance than actual healing. 
The trauma to her flesh had mended easy enough, her scars the only reminder of who she had been. But the other wounds, the ones she could only see when she closed her eyes, they refused to heal. She had hoped to drive them inward far enough that they would never escape, but escape they sometimes did. Wow. <laughs> that is a great beginning. Thank you. <laughs> so you're a criminal defense attorney, but you made Lila a prosecutor. Is there a reason for that? Uh, yes. I, well, I'm, I'm a former criminal defense attorney. I have <laughs> hung up my, my saddle or my right. spurs. I hung up my spurs. <laughs> Uh, but I, I did both criminal and prosecution, but hmm. I, I did mostly defense work. And Bodhi Sandin is a defense attorney. He's a law professor, but he was a defense attorney. And so because I have him as a defense attorney, also because of Lila's past, it made more sense that she'd want to be a prosecutor. Yeah. So um, it just fit the character as well. Hmm. And why did you make Gavin a photographer? Um, I had a roommate in college who was a photographer, and they are not, not alike. However, uh, <laughs> my roommate used his photography business to try and get dates sometimes. And so <laughs> I thought that if somebody were a psychopath and wanted to be out in the world looking for potential victims, that would be a good cover, a good, uh, a good occupation that would introduce you to um, potential victims. So that's where it came from. I knew a photographer like that in college. <laughs> just just wanted to get dates. I don't think he was a serial killer. But there was an actual serial killer. I for, I don't remember his name. It, he was out of California or something that he killed a bunch of women. He was a photographer. And he'd, he'd say he was going to, you know, take photos of them and drive them out to the desert. And many, many of them were never not seen again. I, I, remember, I remember the story, but I, I remember watching like on Forensics File the story of him, but I thought it was yeah. just one victim. So I wasn't aware he had more. No, I thought it was more. I'll have to look it up and get, it, get back to you. So the stolen hours is not exactly a whodunit because we know from early on who to focus on. Yes. And But try as she might, Jill can't find the evidence. I wrote my fourth book because I was annoyed by television's implication that you can always find more evidence if you just look harder, which is like not true. So how did you write around keeping Jill on the trail when she's got no breadcrumbs to follow? Uh, it, it's uh, actually there's two investigators. There's Lila, the prosecutor, and then there's uh, Nikki Vang, who is a de uh, homicide detective, and they kind of work together. But because I was a defense attorney, you know, and I watched like shows like Forensics Files. And there's a, there's a line in there where uh, Gavin, so it's, it's a thriller. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a cat and mouse thriller where you know that Gavin is a bad person from the very beginning. Um, but there's a line early on where he's talking about watching shows like Forensics Files and just laughs at how stupid the people are and the mistakes <laughs> they make. And that's that kind of comes from me. I, <laughs> I watch those shows and I see these people who, who get caught and it's like, wow. You know, you didn't think to throw the tennis shoes away because they left tread prints and uh, yeah. have, have, you know, blood and DNA on them. But so as a defense attorney, you know, you, you daydream. You think, okay, if I were going to commit this crime, the perfect crime, what would I do? How would I construct it? And that's really where Gavin came from. Hmm. And you said you'd been writing your book, Nothing More Dangerous, for 20 years. Why, why is that? Because it sounded like The Life We Bury is your more autobiographical one. Uh, no, actually. The, so I started, that's the story that I started in 92, the short story. Uh, nothing more dangerous. Ah. So I worked on it for 20 years. And after 20 years, it wasn't ready. And I couldn't really tell why. I was too close to it. So I put it aside. And I sat down and wrote The Life We Bury. Um, and so over that 20 years, I had taken so many classes and read so many books on writing technique. I had really come to understand the craft of writing, but I wasn't getting it on that manuscript. So when I did the Life for Barry, it flowed pretty quickly. Um, and then because I wanted to write stories about this same community, I kept going. I did make a lucky um, turn when I was writing the Life for Barry. There's a character in the Life for Barry who is a 50 some year old attorney who has a very small part, but I thought, okay, I've already created this 15 year old boy that I've worked on for 20 years. Let's have him grow up 
to be this attorney law professor. So I, I made Bodhi Sandin, who is a 15 year old boy in that manuscript I worked on, the attorney law professor in the life of Barry, which that is much more autobiographical in terms of I was right. just an idiot as a, as a kid, as a teenager. <laughs> so Bodhi as a teenager is really a lot of who I was. And then I had gone to college and journalism school and law school and um, changed a lot. And then I, I became the Bodhi of the adult version in the life of Barry. So Bodhi is very much more who I am as opposed to autobiographical. Very interesting. Well, thank you so much for that. Thank you. <laughs> now we're going to hear from Vera because I can't wait to hear more about her book. <laughs> okay, I unmuted myself. <laughs> Hi. Um, so uh, my, you briefly queued it up, but my book has kind of a dual plot line uh, in mm -hmm. one plot line, this girl who is a diagnosed psychopath is at university trying to hunt down and kill a boy who she knows from her past. Uh, the other plot line involves um, a serial killer who is on campus trying to kill the seven psychopaths who are in the special program. But uh, I'm going to read a little bit, almost in its entirety, um, chapter two, which is very short, um, okay. which was kind of a risky chapter for reasons that will become obvious. But um, here we go. Here is what I know about Will Bachman. He lives at 1530 Marion Street Northwest, exactly 1,675 feet from my dorm. The nearest police station to his house is a five minute drive away. The first floor windows and front door have iron bars welded over them. Within the past year, there have been 33 violent crimes near, near that house, most of which were armed robberies. Here is what I've derived from any number of his online accounts. Will Bachman is in the SAE fraternity, whose frat house is a few blocks away. His roommate is, a Cordy, is, named, is Cordy, also an SAE. Will Bachman is a junior majoring in political science and deciding if he wants to minor in econ. He's on the lacrosse team, but also likes swimming. I used to swim with him when we were kids. He likes house music and smoking weed. He owns a black Volkswagen Jetta that some asshole dinged in the parking lot of a giant supermarket. He reads the Drudge Report and thinks that all snowflakes need to be melted. He has a mother who wears pearls and volunteers for the Red Cross and a younger brother. They live at 235 Hopper Street, Toms River, New Jersey. I would guess Will shops at the Giant and Shaw because that's where his car was dinged. And he also reported that the closest Safeway to 1530 Marriott Street was quote, filled with cunts who never get the line moving. I know he frequents Buttercream Bakery because he posted about getting his 10th coffee for free. He once lost his cell phone between P and S streets on 14th Street stumbling home drunk so it was probable that he often hung out in that vicinity he did not get he did not like to go east of 7th street because of quote the locals there was a muffin shop within a direct line of sight of will's front door the sort of place where you could camp out with a cup of coffee for a few hours and no one would notice that you were staring at the house across the street scheming i would estimate that will bachman is about 6'1 adams has a decent lacrosse team so he's no doubt athletic and physically stronger than me this is something I should never forget. He has thick blonde hair and a thin upper lip. He wears a white necklace made of small seashells. His friends are a predictable array of frat bros and lacrosse players, mostly white, faces flush with beer, pointing at things in bleary pictures. They drink beer and have themed parties and sail on boats in the Potomac River. It isn't a party until someone is hospitalized with alcohol poisoning, hashtag YOLO. There's Cordy who posts a lot about video games and the NFL. Cordy and his girlfriend, Miranda Yee, appear to be on and off again, but when they are on again, he often sleeps at her apartment in DuPont Circle and not at home, leaving Will alone. Also part of the crew is Mike Ari, who also on the lacrosse team and a member of SAE. Mike appears in pictures with, a, with an array of girls on his arms, sticking their tongues out. This is the sort of girl I could easily be, someone who could slip in and out of someone's life unnoticed. Will, Cordy, and Mike recently attended an event thrown by someone named Charles Portmont. Charles is also an SAE and his Instagram is clogged with posts of people partying. One of the latest showed Will and his friends dressed in white attending a fundraiser. A quick internet search shows that Charles Portmont's father, Luke Portmont, is the Virginia state chairman for the Republican National Committee. The event included lobsters and craft cocktails, hashtag classic Charles. Will Bachman does not have a girlfriend because bros before hoes and because never trust a skink. Will Bachman probably does not have a gun because of the strict gun control laws in DC. 
Will Bachman posts enough about his classes that any intelligent person such as myself could easily figure out his schedule. The hashtag SAE life is used often enough that one could tell what the brothers are up to on any particular weekend, where they're going and who with and how inebriated they'll be. Will Bachman drinks too much and hangs out with people who don't look after him. Will Bachman has made some mistakes. Will Bachman has 60 days to live. So that's chapter two. I am totally down with killing Will Bachman now. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say, I majored in political science and minored in econ. I hope that is all I have in common with that oh, character. Yes. <laughs> Before I got the degree in biology to go into forensics. So, you know, but that sounds really cool. And I love how much she's put together just from basically his social media. You know, so your characters volunteer, like Chloe and the other the other psychopaths, volunteered to participate in a study of psychopaths. I'm wondering, do psychopaths ever admit that they're psychopaths? That's an interesting question. Um, I think a lot of them probably don't know that they are. Um, yeah. And uh, I think the the study of psychopathy was sort of born in the uh, the prisons, people studying human behavior in prisons. Um, because mm -hmm. it is not something to people are typically diagnosed with. If you just kind of standard go to the therapist, psychopathy is not even in the, the DSM, which is the tool that's used to diagnose people. So um, I think it's fairly likely that a lot of people who have it don't know, and that uh, a disproportionate number of people who do know they have it are actually coming from um, the prison population where they've been studied for this purpose. You, you bring so much, obviously, real life knowledge of psychology to this book. Have you worked with psychopaths or, or violent patients? No, I, I'm, I don't see, pa I've never seen patients because I'm a social psychologist, but I mean, oh. I have, uh, the thing that I studied in grad school was, was not related to this at all, although I did study <laughs> empathy a little. Um, I have in my life come across a couple of people who I think probably qualify, I'm sure we all have. Um, when I sort of studied more research about it, I realized, oh, wait, I think I might, I think this person I know actually might be one. Um, because a lot of people, something like one to 3% of the American population um, has psychopathic tendencies. So oftentimes we don't quite know what to call it, but you know it when you see it. Hmm. And on a personal note, <laughs> On a lighter subject, you say you're hopeless at singing or playing an instrument, and yet a pandemic project was writing songs with a friend of yours. Yeah, so how's that going? We're we're working on a musical, um, and we really? it's actually going really well. Uh, I do I do the lyrics, um, and we it was based off of someone else's intellectual property, so that we then made a bid to yeah. get the intellectual property, and that's kind of where we're stalled out because a, a bigger person swooped in. But we're hoping that the uh, grassroots um, project could at some point take off because the songs are actually really good. Uh, so I don't know. Cool. Stay tuned. <laughs> I would definitely go see it. We are huge musical fans in mm -hmm. my family. It's like we know every single one. And, and your blog, I, I said, I love your blog. I think we have very similar tastes in films. So we have to discuss a lot of things at some point. And I was obsessed with Lost. Locke is oh. my absolute favorite, but, but Adam Driver is adorable. I mean, I, I guess I'm okay with not hot, but like ever since Star Wars, I'm like absurdly sentimental now about Adam Driver. But the problem is when you get to my age and you see like a cute guy, it's like, you don't want to date him. You want to adopt him. It's like, <laughs> just want to take him home and feed him milk and cookies and pat him on the head and tell him he's a good boy. You know? That's, what happens. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Okay, well, unfortunately, we have to limit our time here. So we're going to go on to Karen Cleveland and finally hear about Need to Know. No, that was her first book about the current book. Yeah, uh, thanks, Lisa. So uh, You Can Run is about a CIA officer, Jill, whose job is to uh, vet prospective new CIA sources to make sure they are who they say they are. And uh, one day, just as she's getting to work, digging into the CIA's hottest new recruit, 
uh, she gets a call. Her infant son has been taken. And in order to get him back, she has to do something she never thought she would do. Um, so I'll just read a little section here from chapter one, um, where she uh, finds out that her son is gone. So a shrill ring from my phone startles me. I reach for it, check the illuminated screen, unknown, probably some sort of spam. I press the green button and hold the phone to my ear. Hello? We have your son. The voice is deep, robotic, devoid of inflection, an electronically altered voice, the kind I've heard in horror films. We have your son. Panic grips me. This isn't real. This can't be real. Everything's calm in that room. Uh, actually, you know what? I should have said this before I started reading. I'm sorry. Um, so just to set the scene a little bit, she is actually in her car um, on her lunch break. Uh, it, that's sort of the only place that CIA officers can go and check their, their cell phones. And she is checking in on her son in his, uh, in his daycare room just to make sure everything's okay. And she logged onto the video feed. She didn't see her son, but she assumes he's just off getting his diaper changed or something like mm -hmm. that. So um, she's saying everything's, or she's thinking everything's calm in that room, normal, not like someone burst in there and nabbed a child. Who are you, I ask? Breathe the word of this to anyone and you'll never see your son again. It's a scam. It has to be. I've read about this, seen it on the news. A parent receives a call like this, their child's abducted or in trouble, and they panic, clear out their bank accounts, hand over everything. And all the while, the kid's going about his day, safe at school or home or whatever. I get it now. I get why they run straight to the bank, because this is terrifying. I stare at the video feed, the side of the play area that leads to the diaper changing station. He's going to be in that frame any minute now, diaper clean, ready for his bottle. He has to be. You have three minutes to verify this information. I hear a mechanical click followed by a string of short beeps. I pull the phone from my ear and glance at the screen. Call ended. I focus on the laptop again, the video feed. Still no Owen. Oh, you can't stop there. <laughs> that's like that's like every parent's nightmare. It is. It is every yeah. parent's nightmare. And um, actually, I came up with the idea for the book back when I was working at the CIA, and it was after I had dropped my own um, baby at daycare, and I was heading into Langley, and um, you know, I, I had some paperwork due that day, some reinvestigation type paperwork uh, detailing my uh, personal contacts, my finances, just that typical stuff that employees have to regularly update so security can kind of keep tabs on things and make sure that no one's being mm -hmm. compromised. And I remember the thought just striking me as I was walking in from the parking lot that, you know, this is a waste of time. There's no amount of money, no, uh, you know, persuasion or blackmail or anything that would make me betray my country. But if my son were in danger, you know, that might be a different story. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was a very scary thought. Um, so, you know, that's what I, I idea that I came back to years later when I sat down to write, you can run and just tried to put the main character in that scary situation. Like, what would you do if, um, you know, if, if your son's uh, safety was on the line and, and what lengths would you go to? Very interesting. I, I don't have children. And it's like, I'm, I'm writing a book right now where basically it's another kidnapping plot but i had like this woman just pick up the boy from school and the, the boy had gotten texts that said you know you're going to meet this person and my my agent said no there's you know you have to go through you know which i should have known from my sister because she's a school nurse i mean you so i like googled pick up procedures from school. Because when I was a kid, you walked out of the school. Nobody paid it to any attention to where you went. Now it's like, you have to have a code. It's like, if you want someone other than like you to pick up your kids, you have to, you have to give it to them in writing and like appear personally at the school to like, you know, gone are the days of your friend, like forging a note from your mom. You know, <laughs> it's so different now. But in your first book, Need to Know, it sounds like it's kind of similar in the background check area in which a young mom discovers a program she designed to find foreign spies kind of implicates her husband. And you said the idea developed when you thought maybe your fiance was too good to be true. And having been on Catfish for like years, I wish everyone had an access to a CIA program to check out their love interests. So as in this book again she's she's doing background checks on new recruits which 
you know, of course, at a police department, we do that too. Do you have any non-classified stories you can share about weeding out spies? You know, it's, uh, it, it's hard to share specific stories, honestly, you know, um, but uh, it, it just, it was such a fascinating place to work and um, there's so much good work being done there. And, um, you know, I, I think my books kind of deal with these sort of worst case scenarios, but I think um, yeah. there are so many people there doing uh, really good work to kind of make sure that this sort of thing does not happen. And, um, but you know what, it's tough because foreign intelligence services are so sophisticated and um, so aggressive. And so it's, it's a dangerous world out there. So how do your former coworkers feel about, about your writing career? Do they think you're giving away secrets or are they all like, how can I get this gig? <laughs> I, I don't think they're they're too worried that I'm giving away secrets. And we do have a, the publication classifications review board, which is a good check on that. Anything that I write or any uh, former CIA employee writes has to go through the CIA review board that is basically a double check to make sure there is nothing classified in our work. And, you know, I think that's a positive check because uh, we all sort of joined the agency to help protect our country. And the last thing we'd want to do is kind of disclose anything classified. So, um, yeah. 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 So have you ever watched Homeland and how do you feel about their portrayal of CIA agents or any, or any film portrayal of CIA agents? You know, the, the way the agency is portrayed in films and TV, it is so interesting. I, I, I enjoy watching it. I think it's such a fascinating world. And I think that's why I enjoy writing about the world. And we all kind of enjoy reading about the world and, and watching those films and movies, uh, uh, films and TV. Um, I think obviously there's some creative liberties taken and it's not always exactly like true life as we all know with all of our careers and sort of seeing those depicted in, um, in, the, in the media. But um, I think one thing that, is is true to life in homelands and, and a lot of other tv shows and films is just the dedication that people who work there have and uh you know i, I think that i've worked with such a great group of people and ci sometimes gets a bad rap for things but there there's so many successes and so much good stuff going on behind the scenes and so many people who really do care about what they're doing great so one last question is chris is Kristen Harmel really your sister or were you just thinking <laughs> metaphorically yeah. in that tweet? She's my big sister, yep. So how did your family wind up with like two amazingly successful authors in it? And like, <laughs> does the rest of your family feel like they're lucky or, or, they're, or they're cursed or they feel left out or, you know? <laughs> um, it, reading was just always a big part of our childhood, I think. And, and Books were just what, what we did. We, we read a lot as kids. We didn't watch a lot of TV or play video games, I guess. And, you know, I think readers often do become writers and we have a younger brother as well, but he has not, uh, he has not tried to get into writing. So maybe one day he will, I don't know. <laughs> well, that is really neat. Um, okay, apparently, well, thank you so much for that. Chris says we have some questions. So I'm gonna turn it over to Chris. If we can. Right. Um, I want to pull up everybody really quick. Um, one of the questions is for Alan, um, and it's from Carol White. She she's heard that one of your books is in talks for a movie, and wants you to tell us some more. Uh, yes, my debut novel, The Life of Barry, is under option. It's been under option since 2015. Um, they, you know. I, I've kind of lost track of where things stand. Uh, so if that happens, wonderful. If not, you know, we'll move on to bigger and better. But yeah, it, it is still under option. It's still, they're, they're trying to make a movie out of it, but um, it's, it's out there. Great. And there's a question from Alan, actually, for Vera. Um, do psychopaths tend to gravitate to a particular profession, politics, attorneys? Um, I don't know if there is re really reliable data on that. Uh, Robert Hare, who's kind of the father of the study of psychopathy, uh, claims that they tend to be um, disproportionately present, present in the corporate world um, because it is an environment where those sorts of traits actually make you more successful. Um, 
and they're also disproportionately represented in uh, populations of people who committed crimes. Um, so if criming is a, is, is a profession, <laughs> there's that. I have to say, I looked up about the serial killer who was a photographer and it was the dating game serial killer. And the guy actually was on the dating game and he was a photographer and he killed five women in Orange County, California, and then two in New York in the seventies. Um, but when I looked and I said, what professions are most serial killers? And they said, truck drivers, um, long haul people, people that have um, work in freight transportation, that kind of thing. Um, because probably because they're so mobile that you know you can yeah. kill in different states or I, I don't know mm -hmm. but um Karen a question for you is um you you touched on it with the the vetting um of the of vetting the books but I did some research in my book um because I needed a CIA I needed a CIA agent that was uh, signed in an uh, embassy in China. And my protagonist is a DSS agent and she was in Gangzhou. And I discovered as I was doing the book that I could not get to a CIA agent, that the, that the one that's assigned is only assigned in Beijing, the legat, the FBI person. And that you, you know, there's an officer, um, and they're usually communication officers assigned at the various embassies, but th there are no like control, like, like there are no teams that can go in and do emergency extractions and things. It's like takes two weeks in a presidential order. <laughs> so how, how does this, can you say anything about how that actually operates on foreign soil? Um. No, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I can't. Short answer, no. No, no but it does make for difficult research because they are so um, tight-lipped about so many things. Um, you know, I'm often asked how many people work at the agency and there is no answer to that because they never even release a number of, of employees that they have, period. And um, yeah, I mean, most people who are... Uh, overseas, you, you would never know their names or their, um, you know, positions where they're posted, anything like that. So it, it, I can see that that would make research very difficult. But yeah, it's they're very, um, very good at kind of keeping things a secret there. Interesting. <laughs> it's kind of their job. And so, <laughs> Margaret, one question for you about um, the search and rescue aspects. Have you run search and rescue, actually run search and rescue with your dogs, or is that something you have just researched and um, is it something that you want to do? Actually, my husband and I decided to train two dogs in um, search and rescue way back about 30 some years ago when our children were younger. We had a very tragic event here in Colorado where a toddler wandered away from a campsite and was found way too late. Um, the remains indicated that wildlife had either killed that toddler or gotten to him later. Mm -hmm. um, so we were both, you know, very saddened and we also realized it could happen to us. And so we decided we wanted to train these two dogs in search and rescue. Uh, we had a training group with our county that we were able to join up with and we trained the dogs. We did not ourselves become certified because both of us were in a private practice where we were sole employees and we had to, you know, we had to work. And um, so that was something that I had no idea would become useful when, you know, 30 some years later, I would start writing a book that would include that kind of nose work because tracking is tracking, whether it's a patrol dog that's been trained to track a fugitive mm -hmm. or 
a dog that's been trained to track a missing person. Which, which brings up the memory of um, Margaret arranged for uh, a drug dog teacher to come into our Mystery Writers uh, of America meeting one time. And she had five-year-old vials that had cocaine residue in them. And she hid them all over the room. And the dog found them in like 30 seconds flat, all five of them. It was amazing. But um, now that marijuana is legal, some of the dogs have been trained and that's all they smell. So they no longer are useful. And how was, does the dog handle it when they're no longer useful? Well, they have to be retired primarily. It's very hard to retrain them to ignore a scent that they have been trained to hit on. Um, and it was very unfortunate for me because I had already introduced Robo. He had already found marijuana in the series. And so I just had to kind of ignore what was happening in the state of Colorado because I didn't want to retire Robo <laughs> at that point. So um, yeah, it, yeah, but it, it has, you know, it has meant that dogs worth $10,000, $12,000 have had to be retired and jurisdictions have had to go out and buy other dogs to replace them. I remember taking my daughter one time to lacrosse camp at uh, the Air Force Academy and they had drug dogs going through and these kids next to us, these boys, they were having a good old time and the dog came over and just sat down and his wagging his tail and they thought, oh, the dog's being so friendly and not realizing that that was the sign that they had yes. marijuana in their backpacks and those boys got it. Uh -oh. Busted. Yeah, busted. So, well, if anyone else has a question, now is the time to post it in the chat. Um, otherwise, I'll turn it back over to Lisa. Thank you all for coming on. It was wonderful. It was great to hear you read. I'm excited to read all the books. So, yes. thank you for the invitation. We appreciate it. Okay. Well, let's do one quick round robin with everybody. Just tell me. Um, I'm going to go in the order that you're on my screen, but what is next? I know you just finished a book. Are you going to take some time off? <laughs> what are you working on now? And what's next for you? Let's start with Karen. You're, you're on mute. Oh, Karen. Uh, I am. Uh, next up is a book tentatively called The New Neighbor. And it's again with a CIA protagonist, but in lots of secrets and lies. But uh, this time it's secrets cut sort of within a neighborhood, a group of neighbors. Oh, okay. Alan, what's next for you? Uh, my eighth book is already to the publisher. Um, we're doing edits right now, and it's the fourth book that has Max Rupert as the protagonist. And then I'm outlining my my ninth book right now, which will be Bodhi Sandin as an adult attorney. Oh, okay. Margaret? Well, I am very envious, Alan. <laughs> uh, I am working on my eighth book and it is really, I have a chapter and a half um, written um, that book won't come out until spring of 2023. I asked for extra time this time because my husband is retiring from his bed practice. And if our dreams come true, we will be moving to Washington State to be closer to family. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot to do in a year. So, yeah. Yeah. So Vera, what's next for you? Um, I haven't had very much time to write at all because I've been doing a lot of stuff in preparation for this, but today I actually sat down to write the first like paragraph of my next book, which yay. is a mystery. Yeah, yay. So, that's all. <laughs> Two sentences. Okay. Well, I'm sorry that we're out of time, but thank you to our fabulous authors for this wonderful event. This was really fun. And thank you to our viewers for joining us. Next month, tune in on October 18th when Jenny Milchman will talk with Lisa Unger, Lee Goldberg, and Lee and Andrew Grant. Andrew Grant and Lee Child. <laughs>
And actually, it's Andrew Child now. Andrew, Andrew Child. 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 Um, <laughs> and I want to say, Alan um, offered to give a book away, oh. right? Yes. So um, we will take the names of those that um, came in as participants, put them through a random selector, and we'll notify you by email um, after the event. If, and unfortunately, none of the panelists get to be involved in the drawing so. <laughs> but yeah. thank you for for donating the book alan oh my pleasure thank you okay okay thank yeah. you everyone <laughs> thank nice. you good night. night great meeting you nice to meet you good night thank you good night